Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Sydney. And uh, welcome to lockdown for another week or two. Uh, it's, uh, it is odd not having you here and pray that the Lord would just minister his word to your heart today as we read, starting in the book of James. So if you'll turn there, it's great that we still have the capacity to send out God's word and to be encouraged and strengthened in faith. Um, it is so much easier with people in the room, but may the Lord help me to bring forth his word and that it would just, uh, yeah, provide the strength and encouragement he desires we have. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you that we can come to you at all times, that though we are scattered, though we may be um, far from one another and even far from you at times, you draw near to us and you make yourself known to us and you provide your presence and your, your strength and your guidance that we need. And thank you, Lord, that no matter how much we, we know or understand about the gospel or the doctrines of Christianity, we still need you. We still need one another. We still need to pray. And thank you for making us part of a body where we can support and encourage and strengthen one another by the gifts you've given us, by your abundant provision. Pray, Lord, that you be glorified and honored as we read your word and draw near to you. Thank you that you reach out to embrace us, and may we come in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. You'd agree that give and take is part of life and relationships and business. Like politicians, they'll compromise to benefit their constituents or their party. We're often willing to make uh, minor reforms to gain something. Left up to us, we'd rather not be the only ones to change. Uh, we want to see other people changing too, right? We, we don't want to be the only ones to change. Uh, it requires sacrifice and hard work. But think about what God did at Jesus at the cost of his own sacrifice. He, he gave himself to change us, not just modify our behavior, but to make us born again to transform us from within. And the gospel just doesn't make decent people better, but it raises people dead in sins to new life. We are, we are sinners who have been made righteous by the grace of God. And God reminds, reminds us of our, our need to totally change. He, he begins that work and then we, and it's by his grace that work is completed and we're to cooperate and to embrace that change. And, and God wants to change you. And we have to be convinced of this, that we need to change. And this includes the way that we view trials and difficult things in life. Do you see trials as good or bad? Good and bad. We would try to avoid trials whenever possible, but God provides trials by his grace. The tests God gives us are not to see if we are born again or to see if we're his, but because we're his, he gives us trials. Because we're his, he tests us and corrects us and guides us into truth. And it's good when we can see trials as opportunities to change the way we think, to change us to be more like God so that our lives will bring him glory, so that we can rest in his goodness and his faithfulness, his love and redemption. So we're starting our study in the book of James today. This epistle, a little bit of background on it, it's believed to be the earliest written book of the New Testament, around 45 to 48 AD. It's generally viewed the writer is James, the half-brother of Jesus, not James, the brother of John, the apostle. That this James shared the same mother, Mary. He came to faith in Christ. We see his name mentioned in Acts chapter 15 when he was included in the council. The Gospel of Matthew in uh, chapter 33, 13, excuse me, verse 55, it says that Mary went on to have other children with Joseph after Jesus. And we see this by the statement of the people in Nazareth who said, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Paul also made reference to this, to, to this James, the half-brother of Jesus, as an apostle in Galatians 1.19, when he writes, But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. 
this letter of James, it appeals to 21 other Old Testament books. It's more focused on the practice of Christian faith rather than the precepts. So it's not heavy on the doctrinal side, but more on how we ought to live, a life of holiness and righteousness and spiritual maturity before God. And it follows on so well from Hebrews because Hebrews establishes the supremacy of Christ, how we should live in light of God and the gospel, our identity as his beloved children, to be changed by him, to allow ourselves uh, to, to embrace that change that he has for each one. James 1.1, 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. James begins rather humbly here. He doesn't claim authority or bragging that he's the half-brother of Jesus or that he shares genetics with the Son of God. He doesn't name drop, but he, he introduces himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word for bondservant is doulos, which is a slave. The Hebrew audience would have been clued in on what a bondservant is because that was described in Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 15. Under Jewish law, if a person owed a debt they could not pay, they were to be a slave of the person they owed for six years to pay off the debt. But the law also had a provision that if at the end of that time, they loved their master and wanted to continue in a lifetime of voluntary servitude, they could become a bond servant. And the master would take an awl and pierce the ear of the servant to the door, the doorpost of the house, and he was viewed, because of his loyal love, as dear as a son. And in identifying as a bond servant of God, the imagery that James evokes here is clear. He owed a debt of sin he could not pay. Out of love, Jesus was pierced for his forgiveness and freedom. So James delighted to love God, to serve him all his days. And a bondservant would serve until their death or the death of their master. And Jesus Christ, having risen from the dead, we have the privilege of serving him forever. Unlike epistles sent to groups of believers at a particular church like at Corinth or Ephesus, this letter was sent to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. It was written in faith that the Jews who had scattered from Jerusalem would read this letter and it would come to them. I mean, Matt, imagine sending out a letter that would just go out and you're like, I hope these people get this letter. I trust they will. And now we're reading it. People who have, were persecuted, people who were uh, having trouble, wherever they were, uh, they would receive it and receive the wisdom in it. So these people who received this letter, they had been scattered from their hometown, had, were away from their families, had lost their jobs perhaps, were away from what was familiar. To scatter, it means to spread thin. In our common speech, we refer to people as scattered when they are disorganized or distracted. Now, would you agree that it's easy for us to be scattered, to be spread thin, to be distracted with what confronts us in the world. During lockdown, we can't gather. We're, we're scattered in one sense. I don't know where you all are today, but God does. And the call for believers was not, you know, someday you're going to come back to Jerusalem and we'll be able to really have fellowship with God then. No, that wasn't the call at all. It was to seek God, to fix their eyes upon him as faith, the one in faith, the one that they serve. In Christ, these believers were established. They were founded upon that good foundation of Christ, and they were enabled to grow and flourish wherever God scattered them. Like good seeds scattered by the sower, these believers, they had been given all that they needed for life and godliness in the Holy Spirit. They received that good news, they were able to flourish, but they still needed encouragement from the body. They still needed exhortation from others in the church to keep that godly, wise perspective when they were scattered, when they could be distracted and focused on a lot of other things rather than God. This word written to the 12 tribes, it's not just for them though, it's for us. It's so fitting for where we are today. James 1 verse 2, my brethren, 
Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I like that James immediately comes aside them as a brother. He says, brethren. He's not barking out orders like a manager to a subordinate. But he's saying, this is what we need to do. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And it's only by faith in Jesus that we can receive this word without protest or strong opposition. It's just say, like, come on, you have no idea what I'm going through. How can you even say that? When we face trials, what's our tendency? What do we do when we're in a trial? Well, usually complain, disappointed, feel angry or frustrated, depressed. We can be in despair, embittered. The list goes on. Now, James was intimately acquainted with the persecution these believers were facing who had been scattered from Jerusalem. Turn to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. We begin to see some of the things that the church was facing in that time. And in light of the troubles Christian faced, faced we can view... I think the things we see as trials, quite often, they seem very minor. Like the fact that I have to wear a mask, that feels like a trial. But is that really a trial in comparison to what the believers in the early church faced? The persecution that believers in the church are facing today in many parts of the world? It's a very small thing indeed. Acts 12 verse 1, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some, of the church, some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Herod begins to harass and persecute parts of the church, and the Jews were happy about it. And because they were pleased, he also arrested Peter. So there's leaders in the church who did nothing wrong. They've been executed. They've been arrested. Christians were not safe to remain in Jerusalem because they faced oppression by the Jews and the Roman government. People were losing their homes, their livelihood, their inheritance, the good standing in their communities. So by necessity, they left the, really the joyful epicenter of Jewish life in Jerusalem and went to lands full of idolatry where they were the foreigners, where there may not be a synagogue, where there wasn't opportunity to hear teaching from the Torah, to be with other Christians that they knew, where they didn't know the language. And this isn't all. Wherever Christians went, those pious Jews would go out to persecute them. Remember Saul, he went with letters from the high priest that gave him power to go to these foreign lands and to arrest uh, Christians. So they were being persecuted even though they were scattered to be bound and imprisoned. And in light of this, James does not say fight the good fight or resist or go into hiding or come back to Jerusalem. He says, count it, consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. Whatever you view as a trial, in reality, it's a test designed by God to condition and strengthen your faith in Him. These various trials, they test our faith. When we go through trials, we have questions that we want answered. But through the trial, God wants us to have something better than just knowledge about why it's happening or when it will be over or how God can redeem it for our good. He wants our faith to grow, our faith that will endure. Think about a car when it's manufactured, how all the components are tested rigorously. Machines, they're made to put the foam and the fabric just in the, the seats to the test. There are testers who will get in and out of the car 700 times a day who, who have different body styles and wearing different clothing to see how the, the, the fabric will wear. I was reading that one company puts a weighted dummy in a seat. They jostle that car at, for 225 hours straight to simulate 300,000 Ks of rough driving to see how that seat is going to respond to that. 
the temperature in the chambers dropped below freezing to see if those heated seats are actually going to work. Parts of the car, they're put under extreme stress. Engineers understand the importance, that, that important relationship between failure and success. Because if that fabric keeps failing, well, they'll keep trying different fabrics or different ways of sewing it so that it will endure and last. And that's the one they want to manufacture, not the one that fails. The failure of Joshua and the children of Israel at Ai, they learned a lot of lessons from that that they did not learn at the victory of Jericho. Paul wrote this in Romans 12.3, For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Better to be overwhelmed and discover that your faith is small and weak than to assume that our faith is strong when we're trusting in ourselves. The smallest amount of faith in God is strong enough to save a sinner. Yet since we've all been given a measure of faith, there is an end to it. It is finite and God tests and strengthens the real thing. And he wants it to grow. He wants it to endure. Now, trials, they don't create faith. Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We hear the word of God. We believe it. That produces faith in us. Faith in God, it produces patience in trials. So faith combined with a trial, it begins to produce patience. And patience when seen to the end, results in perfection. The word hupomone, it means abiding under. That's the word patience here. It's active endurance. It's subjecting our will to God's will in circumstances that we would naturally try to avoid. We wouldn't want any part of it. It's the quality that we see in Jesus when he went up to Jerusalem knowing he would be crucified. No one wants to be crucified. But he went up to Jerusalem knowing what awaited him because he looked beyond the pain and beyond the suffering and for the joy that was before him, for the victory that would come, he endured trusting in God, thanking God, seeking God. Precept Austin, it describes this patience as a steadfastness, especially as God enable us to remain under or endure whatever challenges, trials, tests, afflictions, etc. he providentially allows in our lives. Developing faith in God, thus patience, it works to this ultimate end that we would be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's what you want, right? We don't all of it often approve of God's way of getting us there. We think it should be another way. We think it should be easier. The bottom line is we don't always trust God. We don't always believe that He's good. We question Him. There's a process and a passage of time that's required between that plant growing, flowering, pollinization, the fruit forming, ripening, and eating. Fruit on a tree, we can see with our eyes. We can see that there's progress being made. But we're, when we're in the painful trial, when we're in the difficulty, we can't see it before our eyes. We can't touch it. We can't say, you know, there wasn't fruit on this tree a year ago, or a month ago. There's fruit now. So in due time, it will, I will be enjoying that fruit soon. We, we don't have that because we walk by faith in God, not by sight. We don't feel it sometimes. We don't, in the middle of the trial, we don't, it, there's nothing in our senses that says this is good or this is going to result in good. It's only by faith in God and his word that he will work all things together for good to those who love God. And a lot of Christians miss out on the benefit of the trial, that good fruit of it, of patience, because it's not mixed with joyful faith in God results in grumbling and bitterness and discouragement marked by impatience. So when we're impatient, often it shows there's a lack of faith. Now you might think, so you're saying I should be joyful in the face of discouragement or the diagnosis of cancer or the news of a tragedy or that I've been made redundant, that I owe on my taxes or that my spouse is cheating on me or we're, we're, down, we're in a lockdown again and I can't do what I need to do. 
We're never joyful to experience trials. You cannot count it all joy when you suffer. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we can. He helps us. Keeping our eyes on him, it's he that directs our gaze. It's he by his grace who strengthens us to hope in him. And he does for what us? He does for us what is impossible for us to do. To rejoice in trials. Do you believe that? That God can do something in you that you can't do yourself. You can't bring yourself to be joyful. You can't even bring yourself to trust. But you believe that because God is good and because this trial has been provided for your benefit, because it's come from him, that it will produce that good fruit to make you perfect and complete, lacking nothing. It's a big challenge, isn't it? James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." God's promise to supply our needs, and one of the things we lack often is His wisdom. We lack patience as well. God's working toward that end, that we would grow in our faith. The scattered Christians, they were facing problems beyond their control. They wondered what to do, where to go, what to say, how to make ends meet. Feeling overwhelmed, that confusion, the indecision, impatience, it exposes weak faith a need for strengthening and conditioning, it prompts us to seek God and His wisdom. Consider this. How many things in your life do you do just because you have to do them? You don't want to do them, but you have to do them. Think about going to the toilet. It's not a hobby. It meets a personal need. A child needs to learn to be toilet trained. They need to recognize the signs in their body that it's time to go to the toilet. A child, they're playing. They're not thinking about wearing a hat or putting on sunscreen. They just, they just want to have fun. But that painful sunburn, it provides a lesson by experience that they need to cover up in the future. Even as we cover up before we get sunburned, we need to learn to seek God early in the trial. Not wait until we are overwhelmed and running all over the place and increasingly scattered to try to escape the trial rather than putting our faith in God at the beginning and resting in Him. God's giving His wisdom. He doesn't hoard it as if He's going to run out. He gives it liberally and without reproach. It's for us to decide if we're going to walk in it or not. It's not like God's hiding Himself and hiding His wisdom and that we need to try to earn it or something. Like he's offered it. It's just, will we walk in it? Will we trust him? He doesn't give grudgingly. Men often give grudgingly if we think that what we're giving is being misused or not treated as it ought to be. Imagine this. My son offers, he, he asks to borrow my car and he comes back and says, I lost it. And I'm like, I would have a problem with that. I would tell him so. I would say, what do you mean I, I loaned you the car and you lost it? You don't know where it is. How is that possible? And then the next day, imagine, he asks to borrow my wife's car, parks it in neutral, doesn't put on the, the brake, and rolls off the cliff, and it's totaled. Uh, and then, unbelievably, uh, imagine I have a rental car because my car is lost and it can't be found, and... I allow him to borrow the car and he trades it for lunch or he trades it for, um, you know, a pair of pants or something. He would be exceptionally bold to come to me the following day and say, can I borrow your new car? Can I please borrow that car? I would not let that happen, right? Because it's like, you haven't really shown much care about what I've already given you. So no, you can't borrow that. But you know, that picture, that son in the story who treated those cars with negligence, that's how we treat God's wisdom sometimes. He's already given it to us, but we forget it. We neglect it. We lose it. We trade it away for something else. 
God doesn't resent us coming to him and asking for more wisdom, even though we haven't been walking wisely until now. The question is, will we come to him? The question isn't, will God give you wisdom? No, he has given and will give you his wisdom. Jesus is wisdom for us, but will we value his wisdom and follow it? Will we choose to go his way or keep going our own way? That's ending in disaster for us. The prerequisite to receiving God's wisdom, the passage tells us, is to ask in faith without doubting. We ask believing in God, believing in his plan, his wisdom to guide us joyfully through every trial. Now, every trial that we face, it's temporary. And man, praise the Lord for that. Every trial is temporary. The wisdom and the word of God will endure forever. James compared those who ask doubting like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Wind supplies energy, and it's the primary factor that determines the size and type of waves that break on the shore. Winding conditions, they're driving, they're tossing, they're, they're putting that force upon the water. And so it's never at rest. And we too can be agitated and stirred by trials. James infers that there are those who ask God for wisdom by faith in him. There's others that ask God for wisdom, but they are filled with doubts. They doubt that he will deliver. They doubt if he could deliver. So one's moved by faith in God. The other one's moved by the trial and the circumstance, wondering if God could do anything to help them. That one who asks faith but doubts, it's a double-minded or two-souled man. It says, unstable in all his ways. There's a cafe I visit. There's this unstable table over in the corner. It's like where I usually sit. Man, it, if you put your coffee or cake on it, it looks stable enough. But if you put any pressure on that table, it makes everything lurch really bad. So you really can't use the table unless you shim it up or put something under one of the, the uh, legs of the table. It's not worth using. Those who trust Christ in faith, we have an anchor. We have a safe haven for our souls. The water can get choppy. The water can blow us all over, but we have that that assurance that he's for us. We are with him and he is in us. It says those who ask doubting, they should not expect to receive anything from God. That trial, it's a test for us. It's not an invitation for us to test God or to tempt him to prove himself to us. Because this this wavering idea, it's fickleness. It's one who's asking God for wisdom, but they're still looking to other people for support and help. They, They hear the truth of God's word, but it doesn't seem to be working. And so they go, well, there must be another way. And they're they're not steadfast in trusting God and relying upon him, putting all their weight on him. Like you say, putting all your eggs in one basket. That is when you ask God in faith, choosing his wisdom. It's like, I'm going God's way. I'm not going to listen to the wisdom of the world or how I feel I should, what I think I should do, but to trust God for that. The one who trusts God lets patience have its perfect work. It puts God's wisdom into practice. Now, God, he's not demanding perfection from us. He knows our frailties David wrote this in Psalm 103, 10 through 14. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God doesn't recount our failures to humiliate or to embarrass us. When we come to him, it's like he reaches down to us like a father or mother reaches down to that little overstimulated, tired child who his schedule is off, who's sleep deprived. Parents know when their kids are tired, when they're hungry, when they haven't had their nap, they haven't had the meal, and, and they give them extra grace because they say, oh man, you're so tired. You're feeling awful. I feel bad for you. I feel that you are, are struggling to just live life today. 
because you missed your, your nap. And if we will give grace to a child who's overtired, who's missed the meal, uh, whose schedule is off, how much more will God give us grace when he knows the trial he's putting us through? He knows what we're going through. He knows how it hurts us, how it's difficult, and how we are confused by it, and it's overwhelming. He knows, and he reaches down to us. He embraces us. The gospel market tells us of a man whose son was demon-possessed. The disciples weren't able to help him. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Mark 9, 24 says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The poor man wasn't double-minded because Christ was his only hope, but he at the same time realized that his faith was weak, that he wondered if, if Jesus could even do anything to help. But Jesus responded in the affirmative. He healed the man's son, and he cast that spirit out permanently. Faith prompted the man to ask for help. He, did, he wasn't perfect, but Jesus answered, and, and he does the same for us when we cry out to him. James 1 verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. The man at the bottom of the social or corporate ladder, the one who is the, the lowly member of the family who doesn't feel accepted, they can rejoice in the spiritual riches that we have through Christ Jesus, that knowledge of of God, the wisdom that we have in, we enjoy as his privileged, beloved children. People without family members near to them, people who are scattered, they can rejoice that they've been adopted by God as his children, that they've been accepted into his family. Those believers who were rendered homeless because of faith in Jesus, they still had a glorious home awaiting them in heaven that they would go to someday. They could rejoice in that. Those who lost jobs, they could still rejoice in their privileged position as bond servants of the Most High God that they could serve Jesus wherever he scattered them. Recently, I drove through an area that had just these great estates and palatial homes guarded by wrought iron gates. And Can you imagine being a homeless person and being given the title deed to that property, you know, paid off, utilities covered, to go from living on the street to enjoying a warm bed and a hot shower, 20-seat theater, heated indoor pool, 10-pin bowling lanes as well. I mean, it's unfathomable, really. And we have a, a home in heaven that's infinitely greater than the, the most tricked-out house that you could possibly have, better than any boat or location or property with God who loves us. That's what's awaiting us in heaven. And we can draw near to him even now in faith. The arms of the Savior, they're open to us to experience his love, to, to experience his presence and joy and wisdom and strength now. So by faith in Christ, we are at home. We are at rest in him. We don't have to be like the waves driven by the sea that's at the mercy of the wind of circumstances. No, we can draw near to him, having been established on the rock of salvation, Jesus. The poor man can, can glory in being exalted by God, and the rich man who has all the world can offer can be blessed in his humiliation. It's one thing to have nothing. It's another thing to have had it and then lose it, Right? Or to have it and realize that my strength and my hope are not in these things that I have. Because the poor man thinks my life will be better if I had those things. The rich man has those things and realizes, like, my life is not in these things. My life is in God. My life is through faith in Him. And when you lose what you had, we can count it all joy in Christ. The one who was rich in goods, who lost them all, is still secure in Christ, 
We have eternal glory in Jesus that will never fade. It can't be lost. It can't be stolen. All the possessions and social status and honor of this world, it cannot purchase our eternal salvation or the hope that we have through the gospel. Saul, he was once rich in the esteem of the Pharisees and his countrymen, and he lost it all, right, because of Christ. He suffered beatings, shipwreck, imprisonment, for Christ's sake, and what was he? He was full of joy and rejoice, just celebrating the Lord. He was full. He wasn't feeling like, oh man, life used to be so much better. He was content in Christ. The sun withers the grass, the flowers drop to the ground. What's beautiful now, it will fade, it will be lost forever. Often we set our hearts and minds on what's temporary on, or on riches that we don't even have. We feel it a grievous trial to be deprived of what's temporary. James, he aims at the hearts who value the temporary things over God and his grace and goodness and all that he supplies, over his wisdom, his joy, his love, his patience, and the perfection that he has in store for us. My grandpa's humorous advice to me was, don't get old. Now, we can't help getting older, but in Christ, we can count it all joy when we fall into various trials that age brings on, knowing that it's from the Lord and will accomplish his purposes. James 1.12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The word translated temptation in verse 12, it's the same word. That's trials in verse 2. Trials can be a temptation to doubt God and his promises and goodness. Because our faith in him is genuine, he tests us so we might endure and be approved. Faith in trials, it produces patience, which enables us to persevere to the end, that we might receive all that God has for us. It's like if you want a passing mark, you have to sit the exam. If we want God's approval, our faith must be tried and survive all the fiery trials he has ordained for us. In Numbers 31, 23, the law has this really cool, uh, I guess, detail that when the children of Israel received spoils of war, the rule of purification was it, if it could go through the fire, it had to go through the fire. So the gold, the silver, the brass, the tin, that would have to go through the fire before they could take possession of it. Now, faith in Christ, that's more precious and enduring than gold. And Satan was spoiled by Christ who redeemed us. Genuine faith, it will endure every trial that God allows. And the qualification we need for God's approval is faith in him. We receive that crown of life through faith in Christ. And when we count it all joy to fall into various trials, it's evidence of our acceptance by God. So that trial is actually a means of us knowing and endurance through faith, that knowing we have been accepted by him and that he, he does love us in a really counterintuitive way by faith. Now, how would your view of getting old or health issues, trials change if you viewed them as from the hand of God? How would your perspective of them change if you knew the painful thing in your life is from God? When bad things happen, people may blame Satan for an attack. But remember Job, he didn't credit Satan with what he suffered. He didn't even see Satan as in the picture, as doing anything when he lost all that he had in his health. He, he viewed everything, all his trial, as from the hand of God alone. And that was true. Faith in God moved him to keep and hold fast to his integrity. As he endured great pain, he was overwhelmed by loss. Yes, he had many questions, but God answered those questions with himself. And Job never received an answer to why God allowed him to suffer. But James 5.11, it tells us the end God intended so that all could know that God is very compassionate and merciful. Isn't that something? Just amazing. Jesus was smitten by God. He was afflicted. So sinners 
could be saved and given eternal life. Now, I don't presume to know why troubles have befallen you, why you are going through this trial. But we can count all joy because our good God, knowing our faith produces patience that results in us being perfect and complete. I don't know what you're going through, but I do know that God will redeem and work together all things for good to those who love God. Paul summed up the most excellent way of living by walking in God's love in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. In expectation and insurance of God keeping his promises, that gives us hope. But this love is the greatest of them all because those who love God will trust him. Those who love God will hope in him. And therefore, those who love him will receive that crown of life God has prepared for us. This passage, it's not to condemn you. It's not to uh, browbeat you about your lack of faith. Indeed, it's to comfort us, to encourage us that whatever we're going through, that it is from the hand of God, that he is working. And though we can't understand it or know fully, we know it is working to uh, move us to completion. So please turn as we close to Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 33. Considering the love of God that he has for all people, especially his beloved children. Romans 8, 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Believer, know that God loves you, that every trial you face, it is from Him. He is able to redeem them. By faith, let's rejoice together in our merciful God who loves us, knowing that he will redeem trials to make us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. May none of us lack his love today because it's extended to us all by grace through faith in Jesus. God bless. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for your power, for your your marvelous love. And thank you for the hope that we have in our Savior Jesus Christ, and that you are working together in our circumstances to reveal yourself and to reveal our need. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring comfort to the hearts of those who are going through the trial, that they might see your hand at work, that they would choose your way of wisdom. Thank you that you don't give wisdom grudgingly or with reproach. You don't remind us of your failures, but our failures, but you just continue to to gift us and to give us your wisdom that we might walk in it, that we might be uh, raised up. And I pray that we would humble ourselves before you, Lord. We would admit that we have gone our own way, that we are like those waves agitated. We have been double-minded. Help us to confess that, Lord. Give us eyes to see. Search our hearts, and may we draw near to you with hearts full of assurance of faith knowing that you who've begun this work will be faithful to complete it. And thank you that you are gracious and compassionate and merciful, that that is really what the book of Job is pointing to. It's your mercy in the trial. It's your uh, comfort that we have and your glorious end where we are most blessed because we trust in you. Lord, thank you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.